morning. people Thank you. 
on uh, this song here. I just put it in once. Obviously, if you want to sing through it twice, oh. just start it again. The guy will pull back in. There's only like three slides. Left. Right. Okay. Thank you. in the street this morning I go whoa Richard is dressed up and I even thought what's he doing today at church <laughs> but what is he going to be leading either communion or song mm, look at song. you yeah, yeah. I'm like you. look at him he's in sharp <laughs> thank you Good morning, church. If we can find our seats, that would be great. This might be a little premature, but if you need a communion cup, somebody will hand one to you, or if not, they're in the back. Good morning, church. We should ask the elders and the elders to be. We need to pick a day where all of us can just talk all day. It would be beautiful. I wouldn't mind one bit. But good morning. And all you who are visiting, good morning. Let's praise our, our Lord this morning with songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, as the Bible teaches us. We'll start with number three. If you're going to use your book, it's page three. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise proclaim. All his hosts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise ye, O ye heaven of heavens, and you floods above the skies. Let them praise this give to home, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Let them praises give Jehovah, they were made at his command. Then forever he established, his degree shall ever stand. Far from the earth, O oh, praise Jehovah, all ye flood, ye dragons all. Fire and hail and snow and vapor, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them praise, give Jehovah, 
for his name alone is high and his glory is exalted and his glory Glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. All you fruitful trees and cedar, all you hills and mountains high, creepy things and beasts and cattle. Birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye people, princes, greater judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praise and give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted. Far above the earth and sky. Amen. 555. Can you please stand? And after this, our brother Felix will lead us in the word of prayer. And remain standing for the prayer, please. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Ask and these things shall be added unto you, singing Alleluia, Alleluia. Ask and it shall be given unto you, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be added unto you, singing Alleluia, Alleluia. Man shall not live by thy bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, singing Alleluia, Alleluia. That is so beautiful from up here. It's it's amazing, Felix. Um, they told me to ask for prayers for Brother Scott's uh, husband's son. He's in the hospital right now with double pneumonia. And as for prayers for those among congregation that are ill, let's go to our Father in prayer. Most kind loving Father in, he in heaven, we are indeed grateful, Lord, for everything you do for us. Help us to see the need to always depend on your righteousness, Lord. We ask that you would help us to be a, an example to the world that's around us, that your name be honored in the way we live our lives. We pray for the country that we live in, to see going to difficult times that we may you may open the heart and soul of this country. We will turn to, to you and honor your holy name. We ask of thee, Lord, for the elders and their families here and throughout the world, preachers and the teachers, and as we are going to about choose elders in this congregation, Lord, that you would bless them and keep them safe, and they may guide us in a way that your name be honored. Please, I ask also for the widows, the orphan, the homeless, the youth or elderly, young ladies contemplating on aborting their children and those that are suffering. We recognize that it is through your son that we have things of salvation. I also pray for Israel, for you said to pray for them. It is through them that you brought your son into the world, teach us your divine and holy ways. 
This we ask in your son's holy name, your Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Felix. We'll sing this once. <clears throat> you are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the mighty God. You are the king of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that I gave to me. You are the song that I sing. We praise thee, O God, for the son of thy love. For Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the spirit of light who has shown us our savior and scattered our night hallelujah thine the glory hallelujah amen hallelujah thine the glory revive us again all glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has brought us and sought us and guided our way. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again, revive us again, fill each hurt with thy love. May each soul be rekindled, death fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, line the glory, revive us again. As we sing these songs next, please keep in mind the Lord's Supper. And um, again, if you did not receive a cup, someone will come and give you one. Just raise your hand and uh, we'll try to take care of you. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Bear a precious fountain. Free to all a healing stream. Rose from Calvary's mountain. In the cross. In the cross be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross, a trembling soul 
Love and mercy found me. There the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever. Till my rapture soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross, O Lamb of God, brings it seems before me. Help me walk from day to day with the shadow for me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory. Till my raptured soul shall see rest beyond the river. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side. To walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Oh, let the blood they crucified, they laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side. To be led by your staff and rod, and to become the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Amen. Morning, everybody. I don't know if you've noticed this. But God's doing something here in Sanger. And I don't know what it is exactly yet. We had 19 teens in my class this morning. And I can promise you they're not here because of my teaching abilities. Um, we usually have about 20. And that's not including those below them that are kids and those above them that are kids. I mean, there is a ton of kids here. Uh, we did the numbers a while back. 20-something adopted people in this congregation. That's not by accident. That's like 20%. Crazy. Where I've all been adopted, you're right, Bill. We've all been adopted by God. 20 physically adopted people in this building. I don't know what exactly he's doing, but um, I feel like he's making it pretty obvious. So a couple weeks ago, um, I got summoned for jury duty. I don't know Donnie's getting excited because Johnny loves jury duty. He's the only person I've ever met who looks forward to summons. 
Um, and at this point, I think I got the first summons last year sometime. And I, I'm the normal jury duty guy. I postpone it as long as I can until the court says, look, you got to come. Like, fine. So I've already postponed it two or three times. And so I finally figured, all right, I'll roll the dice and maybe I'll get off easy. Maybe they won't need me and I can get this rolled over for another year. And you guys know how the system works. Uh, um, they, you call in every night before going in. So I call in Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night. I'm good. And in my uneducated mind, and I'm probably laughing, I thought if they don't need me by Wednesday, they don't need me. I'm good. So I started making plans. I had a meeting set up for Thursday. Called in Wednesday night. It's like check in at 830. Like, Man, I've been getting these for 15 years. Never had to go in. Now I got to go in. So anyway, so you go report, you check in, and, and you hear people talking around you about their feelings of jury duty, and they match up pretty well with mine. Nobody wants to be there because Donnie wasn't in the room. And so people are trying to figure out they should try and get out of it by saying they have to work, and everyone's got their excuses. And then you hear people, ah, oh, but the judge is going to yell at me, and I don't know if I should. Everyone's got to work. Everyone's got kids. Everyone's got whatever. And so everyone's trying to, like, wait, like, do I go for it? Do I not go for it? And again, that analogy of just rolling the dice kept coming up. People just, let's just go with it and see what happens. But once you get in the room, they start explaining some of these things in the process. And that's probably why they do it, to brainwash you. But you kind of get interested and you start thinking, hey, this might actually not be bad. I, I could probably do this. And they started, this was going to be a murder case. And so it was going to go on for up to a month. And even then, it's like, you know what? If there's one thing I've learned at work, it's that I'm totally replaceable. My work will be fine for a month. I'll do this. It kind of gets you excited. You kind of get interested in the process. And then you're kind of like, look, if I got to be here for the morning, just keep me for the month and I'll just do it and we'll be fine. But we waited around to 11.15 and it's not so bad. They're playing Sandlot on the TV. Like it's, it's really not that bad. Uh, but about 11.15 or so, they came out and said they had all the juries they needed. The jury was set. And so they released everybody. And so there's clapping and people are applauding like someone just got married or something. Everyone's excited. And it's almost kind of embarrassing. It's like, this is supposed to be what your civic duty is that what they call it? And we're all pumped that we don't have to fulfill our civic duty. But people are clapping and hollering and, you know, cheering or whatever. But we get selfish, don't we? And that was, I mean, I've talked to Mike yesterday. I, I, the more, the older I get, the one thing I realize more and more is I am incredibly selfish. When we get those jury summons in the mail, some people just throw them out. And, and I, know, I know they do. And I guess talking about rolling the dice. But of course, if I was on trial, I would want a solid, fair, and willing jury to hear my case. I'm positive of that. I would want somebody who was willing to be there for me. Then again, in the big jury room, you even hear people, oh, should I pretend I have a prejudice? Should I pretend I have a bias? The answer is always no. Don't pretend you have a prejudice or a bias. I've never been in a courtroom, and I don't know all the different roles and terms. But in my mind, this kind of brought to life what Jesus does for me and what he does for us. I can see Jesus as an advocate kind of in the juror position. And I thought, man, I'm, I'm glad that Jesus isn't as selfish and harsh as I am. And some of that imagery comes from a few verses here, John chapter two, verses one through two. It says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And in Hebrews chapter seven, verses 23 through 28, it says, now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness. But the oath which came after the law appointed the Son, which has been made perfect forever. And the thing that strikes me about Jesus advocating on my behalf is that I'm guilty. And I know I am. Anybody innocent in here? Nobody. We're all guilty. I know it. He knows it. And I've recently been introduced uh, to the court system through the foster system. And I really struggle with, with the court system. Um, it just, to me, it just does not make sense um, a lot of times. You have someone who can make truly what is a mistake, I mean, a one-time mistake. They look at their phone and they hit somebody, and they might spend the rest of their life in prison because, as they say, they have to pay for it. They have to pay their debt to society. And I don't, again, understand completely what that means. But what I do know is that sin requires payment, and it always has. Sin has always required some kind of payment. 
God cannot and will not ignore sin and the consequences of sin are death. And again, it's always been that way. Even the law of Moses, God set up a method where animals could be used to pay or, or roll forward the sins of the people. And so again, in my in my brain, and, and I always call it my kindergarten brain because I like pictures, but I see myself in a courtroom. And again, I, I don't I don't know these terms or these positions, so don't throw rocks at me. But I see myself in a courtroom with God and Jesus, and, and I'm accounting for my life and what I've done. And again, I'm guilty. I got no way out. I, I know I'm guilty. And there's no way to dispute that. There's no way to argue that point. And so as the, the paper goes through, because this is how I think to do it in the real court system, they have a big stamp that just says guilty. But I think it's my paperwork and it says guilty. And then under that, it says paid in full. And that's about as good as I can hope for. Romans chapter 8. I've got a couple more verses here and I'll wrap this up. Romans chapter 8. We'll do verses 31 through 39. It says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? Nobody. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know exactly how this all works, and I, I don't. And again, I have my own imagery that I put in my mind based off of what I read and how I see things. But I don't know exactly what this looks like. Maybe when God sees me, he just sees the blood of his son, kind of like when Isaac was convinced that Jacob was Esau. I don't, I don't know. Maybe he just sees Jesus. Maybe Jesus advocates on my behalf before the Father so that even though I'm guilty, I'm not condemned, and it's already paid in full. Or maybe I'm just guilty, and I am guilty. I've already said that. There's no way around that. I am guilty. But when the sentence is passed down, it just says, it's finished. And again, look at that, what Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. And I always took that kind of as from a physical sense, like basically saying I'm done. My the prophecies are fulfilled. I've, I've checked every one of them. But if you go back, and again, there's some dispute, and David, don't hit me for this also. But if you look at the Greek, there may be some similarities between saying it is finished, and also the terminology for debt being paid in full. And again, there's some, some disagreement there. But I, I thought about that. When Jesus is on the cross saying it is finished, it's paid for. It's done. You're guilty, but guess what? It's paid for. And the good thing about that, I don't know how this works, but I'm good with any of those options. Any of those things I'm fine with. I'm totally fine with. And one day we'll find out what it looks like. This morning I've told you a lot about what I don't know, um, but here's what I do know. It's very simple. Is that Jesus died for me and paid my debt so I don't have to. And that's everything. It's the craziest story in history. The one perfect human who is God also, but had to become human so we could kill him. He died for me so that I can be with him forever. And I don't understand a lot of things, but I believe that. And that is incredible. That's worth remembering. Let's, uh, let's go to God and thank him for what he's done for us. Father, we come to you this morning and we are just humbled um, by how much value you put on us, by how much you love us, by how much you're willing to pay for us. And we are thankful that even though we are guilty and, and um, we just cannot be good enough, that you see us as worthy of the price of your son. And we're thankful that you set, a, you set something in motion where, where Jesus paid for all of us for eternity. And we just thank you for that, Father. We ask that you would bless this bread as we take it and just help us to remember um, Jesus' body as it was broken on the cross. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our prayer. Father, we come to you again, um, again, just grateful. And, and 
sometimes it's hard to imagine or sometimes it's hard to realize and, and kind of internalize what what truly was done for us and the pain and suffering that Jesus went through and and the rejection of his own from his own people and uh, but he did it anyway God because he loves us and because you love us and we're just we're just so thankful for that we ask that uh, you bless this fruit of the vine your, your son's blood and we ask that you would bless us as we take it we pray these things in Jesus' name amen I want to read a couple of verses talking about giving. I really like uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. And I think the reason is uh, I'm not a big rule guy. And I think 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, they take all the rules that you think you know on giving, they throw them out the window and say, just give. As much as you have, give it. Give out of your poverty. Give what you don't have. Just give it. Be a very generous giver. Be known for giving. I want to read 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, 6 through 15. It says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. How many of you consider yourself enriched in every way? So that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This result... Oh, sorry, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. It's just, again, it becomes more and more obvious. We are incredibly blessed. And I know everyone who gets up here says that. But, I mean, truly, take a take an account of your life, what you've got, what you think you need, and then match it up to what you actually have. I mean, you've got more than you need. We have enough to give, which is culturally crazy. And if you look at the global scale, it's crazy to have more than you need. And, again, I think God expects us to use those blessings to bless others so that people will look and say, man, those Christians are crazy. Why do they do that? And then it goes back to God. Every time it goes back to God. So again, I heard Doug say this up here one time, and I think Julie gasped a little bit, but you don't have to give. Is that what he said? Or if you don't plan on giving today, don't give. All right, there's no no rule. But you think about what Jesus has done for you. Think about what God has done for you. And out of that comes gifts. I mean, there's nothing else to do. It's like you got to do something. You got to give something. So you give. So if God has put that on your heart, um, I encourage you to, to give cheerfully out of the acknowledgement of what God has done for you. Let's go to God one more time. <laughs> Father, we are so thankful. And um, sometimes I don't really know why you, you're so good to us and, and, and why you've given us so much. But Father, I, I, I believe that you expect us to give or, or want us to give uh, as your children. You want us to, to be a little bit more like your son who gave everything and you want us to give through our lives. And we just ask that you put that on our hearts, help us to be cheerful givers, help us to just be incredibly generous, to be known as a generous giving people, so that you will be glorified. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I don't want to take away anything from John of what he said about the teenagers. <clears throat> I'm just going to add to it. You're right, John, about the teenagers, because all these songs that I'm singing, my granddaughters picked them. And, uh, and they love the Lord. They love coming here. And that's not because of me. It's because of God and because of you. And they love you very much. So I just wanted you to know that, John, and all of you. Let's stand and sing uh, this song before the lesson. And sing from your heart. I love this song, by the way. Love it. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living, Jesus is living, Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. He's coming back to claim his own. He's coming back to claim his own. He's coming back. He's coming back, he's coming back to claim his own. So sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Jesus is living in his church. Amen. Good morning, church. I am excited to be here today. Um, if I look a little weathered, it's because I rolled around a lot last night. Um, not out of nervousness, but just excited. And excited about today. Um, excited about the kingdom implications of today. And I hope you are too. Um, I know firsthand that Sanger has been blessed with great leaders over the year. Uh, we've had Harley Wooten, Jim Flint types uh, that were all in when it came to performing their duties. Some of you may not even know those men, but I guarantee you, you benefit from the work of those men. Great leaders do not typically perform in a vacuum. When uh, a movement occurs, Leaders are typically surrounded by great followers. And so that's where we're going to start today. We're going to start talking about followers or a followership, if that's a word. Um, and then Matt Phillips is going to conclude the message today talking about leadership. Okay, some of you might not agree with the statement that I'm about to make, and that's okay. You're entitled. Um, but I believe that there are a few things that are more enjoyable, just a few, than working hard and doing a job with all your might and completing that job. And that's a joy. The finished product when you work hard 
at something that means something and you finish it, it sticks with you. It doesn't dissipate quickly. I bought a new lawnmower this week. Big news. It's a Honda. Okay. And for a guy who likes his lawn to replicate the outfield of Dodger Stadium, that's a big deal. This lawnmower, to me, is a thrill. It can bag, it can mulch, it can cut 21 inch rectangles. If I crisscross cut, which I do, I'm guilty. Um, I can I can cut it high, I can cut it low. Um, I'm just salivating about thinking about going out and watching my grass grow so that I can cut my lawn with this machine. Under the right conditions, meaningful work can be a joy. Hebrews 13, 17 says this. Put it up, guys. It says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be no benefit to you. I have one point to make today. I am a one-trick pony. I have one question to ask all of you who will not be elders or elders' wives. And here's my question. Will you make their joy, will you make their work a joy? Can you do that? If so, let me blast you with some questions and some challenges, and then you can kind of decide for yourself. Number one, will you submit to them? And by the way, submission is not submission when you agree with somebody. It's when you disagree or you have hesitations that you really go forward anyway and you trust, you support. Will you do that? Will you submit to elders when times are ambiguous, when you really don't know? When maybe you think, I do know, and it's not what they think. Number two, as followers, will you feed and encourage your leadership? Leadership is a draining task. Will you send them texts, cards, smoke signals, phone calls, prayers lifted up on their behalf? Number three, will you take your spiritual gifts and combine it with their vision? When they lay out a plan, will you look inward to identify your place in that agenda? Will you pledge your perspiration today, followers? And lastly, will you protect their dignity and reputation? What happens when you see their humanity? Will you shelter them? Will you show discretion and patience? Will you stand with them unified publicly? even when you respectfully disagree in private. Today's a great day because it's a day about followership as well as leadership. Both are essential to work in unison. And in many ways, we will help to set the ceiling for this new eldership. The lawn that these elders will begin to shape is no small job. They'll be in great prayer in trying to have some unified vision for this church to go. They'll be tending to personal matters within the flock and trying to rescue the one while keeping the 99 or the 119, right? They'll be caring for the ministry of God's word in this place. They'll be praying deeply at all times They'll be doing their very best to stay up with those who are in hospitals or struggling with ongoing sickness. 
It's a big job. It's a big lawn. Now, try to imagine doing all that work while you have one self-centered, whiny, backseat driver second-guessing your every move as you're trying to do that great work. It's like having a bag of rocks on your back and you're climbing up a hill and then somebody's stuffing another rock in that bag. Or it can be like mowing a lawn, using a magnificent tool while someone hands you a cool glass of lemonade. It can be a joy. These men and their wives are dedicating themselves to hard work, but they shouldn't be the only ones dedicating themselves to hard work today. Will you make their work a joy? Will you make their work a joy? We're blessed to have amazing individuals that want this position. And I urge you today to get behind them and get behind Bill and Pete and give them your confidence, give them your sensitivity, give them your discretion, give them your submission, and add your spiritual gifts to their vision. Make their job a joy. Make their job a joy. Can I ask you to stand, church? Elders, elders, wives, you can sit because this doesn't apply to you right now. Go ahead. I want to ask the church to make a pledge, and it's based upon 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 18, and then I'll give you a chance to say, I do. Here's the verse. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We're not just installing elders today. We're installing followers. Do you accept this charge, church? You can be seated. Matt Phillips is going to speak now on the subject of Christian leadership. Morning. The um, author and speaker, uh, John C. Maxwell, uh, once wrote something like, if uh, as a leader or as a, as a person in business, if you're one step ahead of your employees or the people following you, they would call you a leader. If you're two steps ahead, they'd call you a visionary. But if you're three or more steps ahead, they might call you a martyr. Meaning, if the leader gets too far out in front of the people he's leading, people are going to want to kill him. Because they don't understand. They're not connected. And so John Maxwell makes a good point in that. And I encourage you guys to think about that. Uh, anybody who is in a leadership role, be it uh, in the church, in your family, or in God's family. Um, John C. Maxwell left out another definition, and I, you'll see why. It's kind of long, but I think if you were to include uh, another definition of leader, it would look something like this. So I'm going to add this to that quote. If as a leader, you find yourself weaving in and out of the people, rubbing elbows, rubbing shoulders, getting dirty, getting messy. 
if as a leader you find yourself in the front a lot, but you always look back to grab someone's hand to follow you, and you're constantly turning behind to make sure people are behind you. Or as a leader, you might find yourself in the back of the group, gently calling out directions, instructions, reminding people where they're supposed to be going, or prompting them to stay, stay with the group. Turn left, turn right, straight ahead. Or if as a leader you sleep with one eye open between your people and the dangers of the world. And those dangers, if they were to arise, lead you to boldness to protect. Or if as a leader you find yourself joyful when others are joyful, angry when others are angry, sick, you find someone sick in your group or hungry in your group or sad, someone being born in your group or taking their last breath and you've done everything you can to either be by their side in all of this or to lift them up in prayer. And it, if you can't, it burns in you that you can't be with them. And finally, as a leader, if you see your people as the precious gifts that they are and you're always reminded of whose they really are and whose you really are. Then if you meet those qualities, you can see why we didn't include that in the quote, it's a little long. If you meet those qualities, you may be called a shepherd. Today, the Holy Spirit has set aside or appointed men who want to be shepherds and their wives who want to co-shepherd with them. And we already know the Holy Spirit has been, been involved because you said no, you said no. And this guy was on the fence maybe a little bit. But God did something, didn't he? We heard your story. We know what he's doing in your life, and we praise him for that. Amen? And there may be other men and their wives in this congregation that the Holy Spirit will come. You're next. We have to be ready for that. My, um, my instructions and my admonishment to you is very simple. 1 John 2, 6 says, if anyone wants to, if anyone who claims to live in, in Christ Jesus, they must walk as Jesus walked. Think about that. They must walk just like him. No pressure. But we already see you doing that. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. And we already see that in you. Thank you. In Philippians chapter 2, we're told about Jesus. We're saying, and being, he's, uh, Paul says, being the very nature God, right? And being the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to hold on to but took the nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Amen? Eye to eye with us went through everything we've gone through. But he goes on to say, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself even more and became obedient to death. Became our slave, became our servant, washed the feet. Even death on the cross. Paul says it goes on that they, because of that, he received the most amazing reward to give him the hierarchy over all of creation. And so there's a promise there. And we go back to verse 5. Because we're not just talking about Jesus. In Philippians 2, Paul says, your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. Again, if you want to claim that you live in him, you must walk as he walks. And it's going to get messy. Right? That's why we've been given the admonishment. 
I never cried over a glass of lemonade before, but when you said hand them a cup of lemonade, that that got me because that's exactly what we as a congregation need to be for these men and women. Refreshment to them. Um, answering the call that the Holy Spirit gives them to pass on to us. And it goes on to say, and so so there's the, the shadow of as I become like Jesus, it may get messy in Philippians 2, but there's a reward that's higher. The, the more I serve, not that you can earn your reward, but the more I serve, the more I wash feet, the higher the reward. Jesus was the ultimate servant, so he received the highest reward. So I want you to not selfishly, but also look forward to what God has in store for you as a reward. In his book, our brother Lynn Anderson wrote this about leadership. The shepherd metaphor shows up more than 500 times in Scripture across both Old and New Testaments. Without question, the dominant biblical model for spiritual leadership is the shepherd and the flock. If we want to understand the biblical model for leadership, we must embrace the concept of shepherd. Most of us can quote the familiar words, the Lord is my shepherd, right? Well, think about that. The Lord, who's the Lord? Jesus is my shepherd. Jesus left the comforts of heaven and came into our universe, our pasture, to do what? To smell like sheep. That's the title of his book. They smell like sheep. That's your new title. Jesus sweated like we do. He walked our pathways. He braved our wolves, he faced our temptations, and he shared our struggles. Amen. The Holy One of Israel came in Jesus Christ to be our good shepherd. This is the essence of spiritual leadership. Sheep following a shepherd because they know and they trust him. Jesus, the chief shepherd, is our model. He is the archetype, the blueprint for the way modern Christian leadership gets done. Good spiritual shepherds today imitate the chief shepherd. Like him, they attract flocks through loving service and authentic relationships, who, which we already see in you. Like him, they, they are trusted as men and women who are committed, to, committed enough to put their lives on the line daily for the precious people they lead. Three times in one brief conversation, Jesus charged Peter, who may be the quintessential uh, person that we can see, he represents earthly leadership in the church. Peter, right? On the rock, his, uh, Christ built his church. But he says three times, feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. By implication, isn't he just saying, isn't Jesus just saying, adopt my spiritual leadership style? Is that what Jesus is saying? A shepherd is someone who has a flock. Flocks naturally gather around food, protection, affection, touch, and voice. Biblical shepherds are those who live among the sheep, serve the sheep, feed, water, and protect the sheep, touch, and talk to the sheep, even lay down their lives for the sheep. Biblical shepherds smell like sheep. The shepherd and flock relationship eloquently implies at least three qualities of spiritual leadership. The first one, availability. The second one, commitment. And the third, trust. Shepherding sheep requires a long-term, costly commitment of self, time, and energy, and the building of open, authentic relationships. Sheep follow their shepherd, church because they know their voice. Trust is earned, not demanded. I've worked under sheepdogs before. There is a difference between a shepherd and a sheepdog. You're not here to nip at heels, barking. 
Your trust is earned and not demanded and is built over time. We must give them time, church. When the lives of leaders are invested in the lives of sheep, the sheep come to know and trust their voices. Being placed in a leadership position does not guarantee a following, but a trail of sheep will usually follow the voice of a trusted shepherd. Amen, church? I conclude with this. If you guys would rise and your wives. Just like the congregation gave assent, I'm going to ask you to do the same. And then Bill and Pete will come. Paul tells the Ephesians elders in Acts chapter 20, he says this, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds, command, of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. You commit your lives to this purpose. Amen. So now I commit you to God, verse 32, and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among the, all those who were sanctified. And the church said, amen. Stay standing while Pete and Bill come up. If I can read this without getting teary eyed. So we, Pete and I, and hopefully the church, exhort you as incoming elders, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, who is among you here at Sanger, exercising the oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God has would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not dom domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Do you gladly receive this responsibility as elders and elders wives? I'd like to add one more unscripted. This is a prayer that I pray every day and I encourage you to. It was Solomon talking to God. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? It's so important to have wisdom and discernment, and you get that from God. So. We could have three men come up here. I'll get over here and you can get in. We're going to ask God's blessing on these three uh, shepherds and elders. God, our Father in heaven, we're so thankful to be here this morning to have these men who have proved themselves by the work that they've done in the past to be able to be called an elder. And we pray, Lord, that this will continue on through their life and and will give positive and benef positive benefit to the church here. Yes, that you will guard them, guard their hearts, guide them and with all wisdom in, in this endeavor. Protect them from the evil one that will come after them in force. Um, help them to, to know what is the trivial things and what are the most important things to deal with. Guide them, fill them with love and compassion and with all wisdom. Be with their families, protect them also, and be with this congregation. Help us to be the people that you would want us to be and to be people that are willing to serve. Let's rest in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.
um, as our tradition, we're going to have an invitation song. Okay. And so in Philippians 2, uh, Paul writes, our attitude should be that of as the same as Christ Jesus. And he's not just talking to these people up here. He's talking to all of us. And so we all fall short of that, don't we? And so you may have a struggle that you're, you're feeling or experiencing right now. Um, or you may have a joy that you want to share with the congregation. Um, I wanted to save the invitation till the end so that we can put these guys to work now. You can um, take any one of these people can go and pray with you, our current elders, or just grab any member of this congregation if you need to share something while we stand and while we sing. Very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I cling, giver to him I cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, on my soul's best song. Faithful loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be me saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. So Donnie and Randy and I each have about 15 minutes prepared to share with you if you just remain standing. Uh, Felix wanted me, uh, it is Scott Hubbard's son that is in need of our prayers. I don't see Scott this morning, but Felix was concerned that he said that wrong. So keep, keep Scott's son in your prayers and Scott as well as he ministers to him. Also this Saturday, Colton Brunson is graduating from Harding University. He's not here, so he can't hear you clapping. Uh, and uh, so, but keep the, uh, I know Curtis and Kristen are flying out uh, to Arkansas to be with him. And so keep them in your prayers, but that's a, exciting news. Uh, if you, if that whole lemonade analogy, you know, it'd be better than that, signing up for VBS. Talk to Tanya. She'd love to have you volunteer uh, to help out with VBS. Tiffs is today. Uh, if you have a third, fourth, fifth, or sixth grader and you don't know what TIFFS is or don't know what to do about it, talk to Kate. She's in the back already getting ready. Or talk to Josh. Uh, but also talk to them about long-term if you'd like to help out with that, either helping with the activities or providing food or anything like that. Don't forget next Sunday, the big uh, birthday potluck on May 7th. We'll also have a guest speaker here from Eastern European Mission, and he's going to do a great uh, job. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to close with this one because it's a little closer to my heart. 
Uh, we need as many people as possible to go up to camp next Saturday. The youth are still going up, right? The youth are going up Friday night. I think they're just having fun. Youth, don't back out because you heard work day. Uh, Friday night, you guys can have fun, stay up late. Uh, the whole camp will be yours as long as you get up by 9 o'clock and help us work on Saturday. Uh, but we need a lot of people because the, the, a few of the jobs we got planned are not going to be com accomplished by youth, uh, except for Connor. Connor's, Connor's still youth. We'll still need your services to put that stupid tarp down. Sorry. Sorry, Carrie. Didn't mean to say that. Uh, but there's a tarp we do every year. Connor's the master. So make sure if, if Connor goes, three of you don't have to go. If Connor doesn't go, we'll need three extra people for the tarp job and Caden. So that's all I got. Let's uh, go to God in prayer. Our, Heavenly, our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us to this point in our lives. Uh, we thank you uh, that uh, all of us, every single one of us has been adopted by you. But more importantly, we thank you that after that adoption, you provided shepherds in our life to continually lead us to the, the good pastures. We pray that you continue to do that. We pray for each and every person who is here this morning. We also pray for those who are not here, that you would just continue uh, to guide us, that you would continue to fill us with your spirit. And Lord, we pray that we will continue to reflect, reflect the glory of your son. We will also reflect his grace and his mercy to the world around us. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.